My name is George Morgan Jr. and I am a third year law student at Quinnipiac University School of Law. I am the president of our Student Bar Association and I am the Northeast Regional Chair of the National Black Law Student Association. And personally, I couldn't be more excited to welcome you all to our event tonight. I'm going to give a moment to my co-host, Camille Lavach, to also introduce herself. Hi everyone, my name is Camille Lavash. I am the president of Quinnipiac's Black Law Students Association. I just wanna take a moment to thank you all for attending our webinar. And without further ado, we'll get started. So no matter what side of the political spectrum you stand on, one cannot deny that the toxicity we have in our country cannot be filtered through masks. So good evening and welcome again to Black Lives Matter. Why Black Lives Matter. I wanna give a quick thank you to our public relations team at Quinnipiac, the interactive media and communications team, all of our esteemed panelists, Professor Ford specifically for pushing us to do something strong and firm during these trying times. And of course, all of our webinar guests. And to our webinar guests, I'd like to remind you all to send questions throughout the program, whether it's during the bios or whether it's during the discussion, we'll be referring to these questions throughout the program tonight. So please do send them in. I wanted to introduce our esteemed panelists uh, in no particular order. First, we have um, Professor Don Sawyer. Professor Sawyer is the Vice President for Equity and Inclusion at Quinnipiac University and is a tenured Associate Professor of Sociology in the Department of Sociology, Criminal Justice, and Anthropology. Professor Sawyer earned his PhD and MA in Sociology as well as his MS in Cultural Foundations of Education from Syracuse University and regularly teaches Intro to Sociology, Sociology of Race, Sociology of Education, and Sociology of Hip Hop Culture at Quinnipiac University. He has also taught social research methods and sociology through film and has research interests in urban education, prisoner reentry, visual sociology, youth culture, hip hop culture, qualitative methods, internal program development, and youth critical media literacy. Mm. Attorney Michael Jefferson is a practicing attorney and a former radio talk show host. He's the founder of the Kayama Movement, a movement dedicated to promoting self-improvement among African-American males of all ages. He's a member of the Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated and previously served as a district representative for the organization's New England region. In 2015, he received his fourth selection as one of the 100 most influential Blacks in the state of Connecticut by the NAACP Connecticut State Conference. Attorney Jefferson is also the author of Dio Vindice, The Resurrection. Next up is attorney Robert Pellegrino. He likes to go by Bob. Attorney Pellegrino is a graduate of Bowdoin College in Maine and received his law degree from the University of Maine School of Law. He has been practicing law for over 30 years while constantly trying to raise his consciousness and the consciousness of whites regarding race relations. He founded an organization called SOAR, which stands for Speak Out Against Racism, in an effort to educate whites and combat the racism found in the white community. He has written extensively about particular issues around race and has spoken at numerous events as well and has co-hosted a local television show dealing with racial issues between blacks and whites. Attorney Pellegrino also published a book titled I See Color, Identifying, Understanding, and Reducing Our Hidden Racism, A White Perspective. And last but not least, we have Professor Gloria Holmes. Dr. Gloria Holmes is a professor emerita at the School of Education at Quinnipiac University in Hamden, Connecticut, where she served as both chair and director of the Master of Arts in Teaching program. Presently, she's an adjunct at the University of South Carolina in the Department of Education. A public speaker and anti-bias activist, she is committed to advancing conversations about race and racism in schools and society. She has worked as a diversity trainer for the Anti-Defamation League and for the Connecticut State Department of Education. An author, Dr. Holmes has published numerous articles and chapters on cultural diversity and social justice. Her book, Justice in Search of Leaders, a handbook for equity-driven school leadership was published in 2018.
Thank you, Camille. So we're going to start tonight before discussion with the video titled Unequal Opportunity Race, which was provided by Professor Holmes. So thank you, Professor Holmes. So thank you again, Professor Holmes, for providing us with that video. Now, I want to ask the first question to Professor Holmes. Could you explain what the equal opportunity race or the unequal opportunity race means in the face of the Black Lives Matter movement today? Yeah, good evening. Uh, and I'd like to just thank George and Camille and uh, Professor Ford for making this happen. Um, I'd like to open uh, with a quote as part of my answer. Uh, this quote comes from Nicole Hannah-Jones, uh, her introduction to the 1619 Project. And she said, quote, 
Our founding ideals of liberty and equality were false when they were written. Black Americans fought to make them true. Without this struggle, America would have no democracy at all, unquote. So the point that I wanna make is that um, African Americans, Blacks, uh, Negroes have been maligned since really 1492, but we, we try to talk about them or the history in this country from 1619, uh, but they've been maligned from the beginning. However, from the beginning of their time here in this country, they've been working to make America live up to its own values and ideals. And I think what I see is that the Black Lives Matter movement is really just part of a continuum that Black people in this country have been fighting forever uh, to become full citizens. And I think we are still engaged in that fight. Uh, the irony for me is that the video is using a metaphor of a race to talk about race and racism. And I think the most important thing that I would leave uh, with you in terms of the significance of the video is that it's telling us all that you can't really define race racism in terms of individual acts between uh, individuals or groups, that racism really is involved with structural issues. And that's what the, um, the video was trying to make clear. Discrimination, school to prison pipeline, uh, racial profiling, et cetera, those, or, or housing segregation, those are all um, indicative of structural racism that exists in this country. Thank you, Professor Holmes. Um, my next question is what is the imposter syndrome and how can the imposter syndrome be tied to the unequal opportunity race? And this is just a reminder for all of our panelists. You don't have to wait if any, if George or I are asking one person, you can just raise your hand and chime in. Would you like to hear the question again, Professor Holmes? Oh, is that for me? Um, well, since you just finished speaking about the unequal opportunity race, um, feel free to take the lead on this, or if any of our other panelists would like to take the lead, that's fine too. Um, I'll just repeat. What is the imposter syndrome? And how can the imposter syndrome be tied to the unequal opportunity race? My understanding of the imposter uh, syndrome is that it is a sense of inability or a lack of confidence in one's ability to perform. And usually I think it's, it's, um, it's, desi it's designed to uh, address issues in a, in, in a work setting. And I think that it uh, is connected to discussions of race and racism and privilege because if, as, as I certainly could talk about, if people of color have been demonized historically uh, and made to feel less than, uh, it does impact how they may feel uh, competent or not competent in a work environment. So I see that as part of a larger issue connected to privilege and race and, you know, structural issues. No, can I chime in there, um, Camille? And again, I want to thank uh, Camille and George and Professor Ford for putting this, this uh, very much needed uh, panel discussion together. 
the um, I think uh, Dr. Um, Holmes is is absolutely right. The the imposter syndrome uh, speaks to the socialization process in American society. How we are socialized as uh, individuals in this society. So whites are socialized to believe in this false sense of superiority about themselves. Blacks are socialized to believe in a false sense of inferiority about ourselves. We're inundated um, through the pop culture, uh, Hollywood, education, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and that's how the socialization is accomplished. For example, men are, are, are socialized to think a certain way about women. So all men, to some degree, harbor sexist sentiments. All whites, to some degree, harbor racist sentiments. All blacks, to some degree, harbor sentiments that can be construed as self-hating in nature. And this socialization does not go away or uh, magically fade away when someone becomes a police officer. If you're white, you're bringing that socialization um, to the job. If you're black, you're bringing that socialization to the job. And if you add to that socialization, the whole notion of, of the criminalization of, of black males, um, then you're, you're going to have what we have today. And that's how Black Lives Matter came into existence, because Black Lives Matter is reminding folks that black lives, in fact, do matter because it doesn't, that black lives don't appear to matter. Uh, certainly um, when it comes to uh, policing the black community. So it is a, an epic reminder um, to society in, in, in general and white society in particular that um, state sponsored terrorism against uh, black people is born out of the belief, the socialization process that um, black people are criminals, and if we uh, that 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 black people must uh, be put in its place. The bedrock principle of law enforcement in America in America is the protection of white life and property. That has not been challenged. It has gone unchallenged for time immemorial. And, 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 and so what we see today is an awakening. And, and folks, you know, uh, when it comes to change, folks don't like change. We resist uh, change. So those in the dominant culture are fighting back um, because this is foreign to them. It's not foreign to us, it's, it's, but, it, but it's foreign to so many. And it's, 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 it's basically upsetting that, that, that apple cart. So that's what we have now. And that's, and that's why Black Lives Matter is so important because it's such a reminder. It's, it's, it's a reminder that um, our, our lives do in fact count, that our lives have value. And, and when you see, uh, for example, uh, black police officers engaging in acts of police misconduct, again, it speaks to the socialization of black people. Um, so um, it, it, black people have devalued black life based on that socialization. And so any allegiance um, in some cases to the black community is trumped by this, this, this need to have affirmation from one's um, uh, white fellow cops, for example. So I'll act like them so that they affirm uh, my existence and that I'm looked upon as one of them. Um, and that's, uh, you know, um, the, 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 you know, the unfortunate, um, you know, side of, 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 you know, what black police officers are, are doing out there. Not all, but certainly some. Attorney Jefferson and Professor Sawyer. We have a question in the Q&A, and I think you both could really help me to answer this question. So Miriam, thank you for your question. The question says that basically Miriam is wondering um, whose idea it was to hold this event. And this question is due to the belief that fundamentally it is not current 
uniquely and never has been the job of black people to educate white people about privilege. And hosting and attending events like this can put the onus on those who are oppressed. I thought this was the perfect time to address this question because we were speaking about the imposter syndrome. And personally, I feel like I would be feeding into the imposter syndrome if I didn't feel it was necessary to host an event like this. Because for me, the imposter syndrome is to cower in my black skin, to mute my own voice and to not think that I deserve to be heard on these issues. So personally, I don't feel like it's just about educating others, but it's also about being heard after years of not being heard. But you both are far more intellectual than I am. So I would love for you both to give us an answer. And we could start with um, Professor Sawyer. I think in situations like this, it's the idea of both and. Um, I think that white people have a responsibility to work with and educate themselves um, and educate other white people. I do think that responsibility exists. But I also think it's our responsibility as Black, Indigenous, or people of color to tell these stories, right? Far too long, these stories have been marginalized. And so when we talk about these, these movements, it's about centering our stories and being able to tell our own stories. Because if you think about history, um, one of the reasons why we don't necessarily know our own stories is because no one is telling them. And so I think these are opportunities for us to tell um, our stories, to speak our own truth, to define ourselves, name ourselves, um, and speak for ourselves without being defined, spoken for, or named um, by others. That, that, that's the, the principle of Kujijakulia. So I think it's, it's both and. I don't think it's any um, one way to go about it. So I think we have a responsibility and we have to center our voices and our stories. And I think that people who would consider themselves as allies, and even if they don't consider themselves as allies, they have the responsibility to impact their sphere of influence, which in this case, if we're talking about race, is working with other white people and educating them as well. So I think it's both and. Um, <clears throat> I don't own racism and I won't ever own racism. Uh, I will own my sexism, I will own um, self-hatred. I will own the socialization process that has impacted me. Um, it is not the job of Black people to uh, continuously teach white people and educate white people about uh, racism. Um, if you choose to do it, so be it. Um, but I don't think it's, we have an obligation to shoulder that burden. Um, we have a lot of work to do in resolving um, the impact of the socialization process on the Black community. And that's self-hatred, because there's a great uh, deal of self-hatred in the Black community. And we have to spend a little more time, I think, um, dealing and wrestling um, with those, those kind of issues. Um, if we're going to create uh, the safe havens um, that I think are needed, um, uh, for our community to um, be successful and to and to thrive, so um, I don't knock those who who, who want to take the time out. I've certainly uh, engaged whites in 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 this sort of dialogue, but I'm not going to waste too much time. I'm be quite frank with you about that. I have um, I, I need to spend a lot of energy um, talking about these issues with uh, young black minds and exchanging. Um, ideas and, and answering questions, and in fact, uh, learning from them as well. So, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't own racism. I don't think black people should own racism. I think we have a we have a a, a bigger problem uh, in terms of fighting uh, self hatred within the black community. Thank you, Attorney Jefferson. Um, I'm going to jump in there and ask Bob. Um, start with you. How do you define racism? Do you believe in reverse racism? And how would you respond to someone using the all lives matter argument in order to invite them into the struggle for racial justice? Mm. Oh, Bob, your mic is muted. Thank you. For me, uh, racism is the belief that one's race is superior to another, usually unconsciously or whites, uh, coupled with the ability to press based upon that belief. So that in America, it doesn't make much sense to talk about reverse racism because whites have the institutional, structural, racist and the legal uh, powers behind us. We're able to practice 
racism. And I, I say unconscious because most whites don't, we don't realize that we are practicing it, um, but we are. As a matter of fact, to kind of dovetail what Mike said earlier, I don't believe a white person can grow up in America and not harbor racist sentiment. Um, if you don't start with that premise as a white person, I think you're gonna be lost. Um, to say that I'm a racist, apparently the sting is too much for most whites so that the conversation almost gets shut down. So my belief in trying to talk to whites about this topic is, is to say that you're socialized such that growing up, you have to harbor and you do harbor some racist sentiment. Um, so there is no reverse racism. It doesn't make sense really to talk about blacks being racist toward whites. Blacks have certainly argued for hundreds of years for equal opportunities, but it's not the same, it's not the same dynamic. Uh, to your other question about all lives matter, you know, that's just a, that's a whitewash for whites to feel good about talking about every uh, life matters when really white lives aren't catching hell, like black lives are. It's trying to redefine someone's oppression, which we've done historically uh, forever. I sometimes tell whites, is it okay to have uh, breast cancer awareness month? Can't people with other cancers argue that why are we specializing why are we making a special month for breast cancer? I mean, people have a right to define their oppression and talk about their oppression. And historically, what we've done as whites is to try to change the, uh, the, the topic, change the dialogue, or, or redefine uh, the, the discussion or the oppression. Thank you. Um, I'm interested to learn what each of your responses are. Um, to someone using the All Lives Matter movement, actually, if you could each um, chime in on that. I'd Professor, I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to say something. Um, I understand the idea that Black people are not supposed to be expected to fix white people, and yet one of the things that concerns me is that when white people are talking to each other about race and racism and oppression, it's almost like they're in an echo chamber. So I don't know how to not allow my voice and my pain and my experience to matter unless I create spaces where those conversations can happen. And I understand fully the idea that black people need to fix themselves, that you know, um, hatred, self-hatred is something that we've struggled with. And considering that we've been um, brainwashed since 1619 or 1492, if you want to go back that far, um, and demonized and told that we are less than human, it has been so effective that even in the Black Lives Movement, there are people who are carrying signs saying, I am a man, that in 2020, Black people have to affirm their humanhood. They have to wear signs to do that. The first time I remember seeing that was with a, a march Dr. King led, I think it was for sanitation workers. And I've used that, that picture in presentations because one of the things that's ironic about that original picture with Dr. Martin Luther King is that there is a white man in the march with black men holding the sign that say, I am a man. The white man is supporting them, but he doesn't have to wear, he doesn't have to hold up a sign because his white privilege affirms his manhood the black men have to say, I am a man. And in 2020, they are still doing that. One of the, um, 
one of the signs that struck me in the uh, protest that I've seen recently is one that says, my skin is not a crime. That really struck me and it hurts even to say it out loud, but that again, black people have to affirm their right to, feel, to full humanity, to full citizenship. If I am not able to share that story with white people, then I don't understand how we can get them to understand it. Because if they are simply talking to each other about race, they will only hear each other's voices. Doc, and Doc, therefore, I, I feel that I, and maybe, maybe that's because I come to this from the vantage point of uh, an educator. Maybe, Doc, but here's the thing. If, if that was a dog, in place of George Floyd, I think we would have had a different kind of reaction from most of America. If that was a dog, they understand, white people understand this situation. They don't want, they may not want to recognize it. They understand we're human beings. They just don't want to recognize our humanity. They recognize the dog being tortured. They recognize a dog being slayed. Every time you turn around, save some species, whether it's baby harp, seals, or but so they understand quite uh, well um, when they want to um, the humanity of others. They choose not to understand ours because of the contempt that is so entrenched in the racism and psyche of this of this society. So, and and you have to assume that they think you can teach them something. The racism is so deep that I don't think, mo a lot of whites don't think black people can teach them anything, no matter how smart you are, how many degrees you have, because that's, that's how entrenched racism is. And you gotta, you gotta assume that they're gonna believe you, because they don't even, half the time they don't believe you. Without video, I don't think they would believe half the stories about police misconduct. For years they haven't believed half the stories that we shared about police uh, uh, misconduct and police brutality. In fact, when Rodney King was was uh, nearly beaten to death, uh, the jury uh, acquitted the officers. The first jury acquitted the officers. That was right in front of our faces. So I just listen. I'm I'm a little pessimistic, a little cynical when it comes to this whole notion of. Uh, engaging white people. Look, I want as many whites as possible to get on that journey where Bob Pellegrino is, that journey from liberalism to uh, becoming an anti-racist, to, to be able to say, I have to, I own my racism. And, uh, and, and, and I want to get on this journey and stay on this journey. And I know it's difficult because here's the thing. Never in the history of this country have we seen a mass movement by white people to confront racism. Even in the protest today, you see thousands of whites marching with blacks, but they're not marching in their communities. You don't see predominantly white mass, uh, movements marching in those suburban communities where the racism grows and exists. They Turn don't know what that means. Attorney Jefferson, I have a question for you. I want to add on to this discussion. No, because you're, you're going in a, in, a, in a great direction and it's going in, in the direction of one of my favorite professors from Quinnipiac, um, Professor Meyer. So her question was, one of the things that always hits me was that black voices are systemically not believed, especially in the courtroom. Then she touches on something you just spoke on, which was now with video proof, black narratives are being believed but that in itself just reinforces the norm of disbelief. Do you all have thoughts about how the law can be changed to procedurally or substantively affirm belief in black voices? I, I, so I, I come at it differently from uh, Attorney Jefferson and I can't really speak about the law. I speak because the law exists, but people enforce the law that's on the books, right? 
And so for me, um, I, I come from a space uh, that Dr. Holmes comes from, um, and, and, and I think it's a, it's, it's a balance, right? And I, and I think there can be certain extremes. When I have a student in my class in sociology of race, I don't necessarily see, and who's a white student, I don't see them in the same light that I would see someone who's been on this earth for a long time and who should know better. And so in that space, in my sphere of influence, I think it is my duty to share with them stories and hope that there will be some form of transformation, if not in my class at some point later down the, down the road. Um, so I haven't gotten to the place where I'm such a cynic that I don't think I have a responsibility to change and to create the reality that I wanna see here. Now, there are different folks that I won't necessarily give that same grace to, but as an educator um, and, and, and in that place of the classroom, I believe I do have a responsibility and I do share my story in that space in the hopes that somebody is gonna be transformed, specifically when I'm teaching students who, are, who have hopes and dreams and aspirations of becoming law enforcement, right? I have to plant my seeds early. And if I don't, I can't leave it up to them to get it from somewhere else. And so I take that on as my responsibility. Now that's not what everybody else feels that they need to do, but as an educator of, 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 of students um, that I'm entrusted with, that, that's the way that I approach it in that space. Dr. Sawyer, I can appreciate that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm surrounded by educators. My wife's an educator. I can certainly appreciate uh, where you're going. To, to, to answer your question, George, I don't think you can resolve that legally. Uh, a judge once told me, he said, <clears throat> Mike, it was very scary, actually. He said, Mike, you know, if we, when we, if we stop believing the cops, the system will fail. That's what he told me. If we stop believing the cops, the system will fail. They believe the cops. That's just, that's what it is. I mean, so, you know, you have to, as, as a practitioner, what I try to do is bring out the humanity of my clients, particularly my black clients. Uh, having a white client is much easier in, 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 in resolving cases in criminal court in Connecticut, and I would imagine elsewhere, than it is when you have a black client, it's just the reality. And you have to bring out that, that humanity and of, of, of your client that he or she, you know, does have a family who love them. They have a job, they have ambitions. You, uh, you know, they have a story to tell. You, 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 you have to communicate that because the other side doesn't necessarily uh, and automatically get that. It's easier with white clients. And I'll tell you, uh, there was a time, you know, I had a, a, a there was a, a I got a, a client, she was a white girl. She was in college in California. So her father, she got jammed up on some drug charges. So I told the father, I said, listen, give me um, a picture of her driver's license in color and, and, and her, uh, you know, her uh, report card, for lack of a better word. And he said, why the, why the driver's license? I said, trust me, just give me the driver's license. I got that driver's license because I wanted to, the prosecutors to see that this was a white girl with blonde hair and blue eyes. So it makes my job easier to get her off because I know how the system responds to the white criminal defendant. That's how real it is. Um, can I just... A, yes, go ahead, Professor. Yeah, I just I just want to make a, a comment. Um, white, in in my experience, in my reading, in my interactions with students uh, over the years, white people do not acknowledge whiteness in terms of the the um, privilege that it and the power that's invested in that in this country i even at quinnipiac when i was teaching in the school of ed year after year students would not acknowledge that whiteness meant something for them because they assume well first of all whiteness and white privilege is sort of described as, as something that's meant to be invisible. That these are, these are assets you have, but you're not supposed to be aware of them. That's what white privilege 
is. And so I can't start from the assumption that white people think about whiteness for themselves the way black people think about whiteness for them. In other words, we understand whiteness and white privilege and how it operates because we are in a, not a dominant position in this society. We have to pay attention to how white people respond to each other and to us. And even that um, idea that um, was just suggested that you had to take a, uh, a license so that whiteness could be the pass to get your client um, off. We know how that works. Black people understand what it means to be black. We live with it every day. We talk about being black. We talk about it, and I'm generalizing here, but we talk about it among ourselves. We talk about how we relate to white people. But I'm not sure that white people talk about whiteness among themselves in the same way. I don't think they understand that power and privilege, um, I think is partly denial. I think it's self-serving, but I think that is part of the problem that needs to be addressed if we're going to try to uproot racism and move forward. And I and I don't and that's what I meant about talking um, uh, that white people are just trying to solve these issues by themselves. For me, that means they're, they are in a, a kind of um, space where they're hearing their own versions of reality. Their um, version of reality is not ours. Professor Holmes, thank you for your comment. We actually had a comment in the section that said, you're very missed and some of our panelists have learned a lot from you while you were teaching at Quinnipiac University. Mm -hmm. Hello to whoever you are. I'm still um, using the same email, so tech, send me an email. My next question, the next question that I have is from an attendee who is a retired police officer. The question reads, I want it said that I agree with Attorney Jefferson to a certain extent, but when police officers who do not stand for the socialization idea of the white regime and suffer as a result because they know, know who they are and refuse to adhere to any of their ideas, how do we change the systemic problem without true revolution? Because it seems like that's all white people understand because they do not only, not only do they not understand, they're not really interested in understanding. Anyone feel free to chime in. Can I just, I wanna address some of that, um, but I also wanna go back to some of the other comments that I made. I do think it is an echo chamber like the professor said, but I think a really important distinction has to be made. And if we can make it at this time and place in the country, uh, Will be better served and that is that um, we need these white liberals to become anti-racists and anti-racists like myself i've been involved in this for about 30 years 98 percent of what i know about race came from black people um, most white people i talk to in that echo chamber have opinions i have knowledge i got knowledge about racism the same way i got knowledge about law i studied i read I watch documentaries. I spent hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of hours dialoguing with my black friends and family members. And the information that I have about race is from black people. And when you have white people who say they wanna discuss this or they wanna move forward on this topic, it's, I ask them, how do you know what you know about race and racism? Tell me where you get your information from. I submit to you that 95% of the white people will answer that question 
very quickly and say, well, it's just information I have, or I was taught that by somebody at school or something. They don't have specific sources. They don't have specific movies, documentaries, discussions they've had with anyone of color. And so what they have are a lot of opinions. They don't have knowledge. And if we're gonna solve this problem on the white side of this discussion, white people need to admit several things. We need to admit that by growing up in America, you harbor racist sentiment. If we cannot do that, we can't move forward. It's, it's a problem of denial. And whether that denial comes from guilt or embarrassment, it's not important, it's, it's denial. You talk to a drug addict or an alcoholic and try to get them to admit they, they have an addiction problem, it's nearly impossible. Well, it's nearly impossible to get white people to admit that we harbor racist sentiment. But if you can get them to that point, then maybe we will seek out the knowledge on the topic. And if you can turn those white liberals into anti-racists, then maybe some of the structural and institutional changes that we need can get done. Because then we can make the changes that we have access to. Um, and we have not done that. White liberals, there's a lot of white liberals out there now in, in this movement, and what they want to do is quote unquote, help black people help people of color. You know why? Because that makes us feel good. Because you're going to pat us on the back and tell us how great we are for helping you. Go into the white community like, like Attorney Jefferson was talking about and try to tell white people about racism. They're not going to pat you on the back. They're going to kick you in the behind and get you out of there. It's not as much fun. It's a heck of a lot more work. You're not going to get congratulated a lot. And that's why less than 1% of whites in America are anti-racist. Every anti-racist book an author that I've read from Tim Wise to Robin. Uh, Angelo. Thank you. Um, every single one of them admit that they harbor racist sentiment. They're anti-racists. They're the ones who understand racism as white people better than nearly all white people in America. And they all came to the same conclusion that I came to separately from them. And that is that we harbor certain racist sentiment. We may not practice it in a Intent, intentful way, but we practice it because we're unaware. It's our job to educate ourselves, and then it's our job to ruin that echo chamber and to educate other whites on that topic. But if we stay as white liberals and do the things that's easy to help and hold that sign up and to try to feel part of that revolution without revolutioning our minds and our own community, we're not going to we're not going to move forward. Mike and I have been talking about this stuff together in front of groups for 25 years. And we both predicted that we will be here in 25 years talking about the same thing. And here we are, only because white people have done nothing to educate ourselves on any systematic level or, or to get to any level of sophistication so that we can dialogue with one another on an on a understanding basis with knowledge and not opinion. I, I think you make a great point, Bob, um, when you talk about, because you, you make a distinction and a difference between a white liberal and a white anti-racist. Um, and, and I think that's important for people um, to understand. And when we talk about being anti-racist, it's not saying what you're not, like I'm not racist, like okay, but are you anti-racist? Are you actively engaged in dismantling the systems of oppression for people who are marginalized, right? And so that's the part that I think it's important for us to understand. The other thing that I'll say is that when we think about why white people may not talk about race, or think about their privilege, it's, it's almost like a fish in water. A fish doesn't understand what water is. It's just its norm, it's around it all the time. The other piece is that for people of color, and spe specifically black people, I know I had to understand my own culture and I, I had to understand whiteness in order to survive, right? In order for me to survive in an American um, context, I had to know my culture and I also had to understand white culture and whiteness in order for me to survive and, and navigate. But from a privileged space, White people don't, don't have to understand the marginalized cultures in order for them to survive because they don't need to have that understanding or that grounding to be successful and to live a life. And so when we talk about being anti-racist, it's a disruption that has to happen that has not been thought about because you don't think about the things that are normal, right? The things that you take for granted every day. Like I don't get up and necessarily think that I'm a man, right? I think that I'm a black man, I understand that, but I'm, as, as a man, I don't think about it, right? Because I too, I harbor sex, sexist sentiments just because of the way that I've been socialized. And I had to work to disrupt that. And so the same thing, that's what white people have to do, right? To move from white liberalism um, to being anti-racist. And the last thing I'll say is within the past two weeks, this awakening that has happened 
where people are suddenly seeming to realize that racism exists. Like, I mean, I guess it just hit them two weeks ago with, with all of these uprisings. One of the things that has been, sometimes it's, it's, it's been welcomed, but other times it's been painful. Like all of the messages I receive um, from you know, white colleagues and white friends saying, hey, look what I'm doing, right? In a sense, it seemed like they wanted to be pat, patted on the back. And so from my standpoint, it was like, I'm not here to be your cheerleader and to, and, and, and to, and to clap for you. I'm not here to necessarily be your moral compass. I appreciate the work that you're doing, but I want you to continue to do that work and not be so invested in how I think about you now because you posted this or you attended a protest or you wear this shirt. Thank you both for your answers just now. You both said a lot of very deep things that really touched me. So Mr. Bob, I, I have to call you Mr. I'm sorry. But Mr. Bob, Attorney Bob, talking about the opinion versus knowledge, that was, that was deep. And there's a question specifically for you that I, I'm going to read to you right now. And then Professor Sawyer, we have a question for you. I want you to answer yours first. So Mr. Bob, you have been involved with the civil rights movement for years. Has the recent death of George Floyd changed your approach to educating others? So I want you to think about that while we um, move to Professor Sawyer. So Mr. Sawyer, has there been any discussion with the university leadership regarding recognizing, commemorating, or observing Juneteenth as a university holiday? As a university holiday, we, we've, we, we've had discussions. Um, and, and so the, the first step, it's going to be um, some education that's going to be coming out um, tomorrow about Juneteenth. Um, we've never celebrated Juneteenth before. A lot of people have never celebrated Juneteenth before. And so we, we're starting to see a lot of energy surrounding it. Um, and I'm skeptical of, of people who are, who, are, who are pushing for it now, not saying that we shouldn't celebrate it, um, but it, it comes along in the same lines as those who are writing um, emails looking um, to be congratulated. Um, and so we have been discussing Juneteenth. Um, there's going to be some educational, um, there's going to be educational posts about Juneteenth and we're continuing the meetings to talk about like how we will celebrate it um, on campus in an intentional way and not just be to do it to be reactionary. Thank you very much. And Mr. Bob, it's your turn. I think I'm certainly better at talking to white people now than I was 30 years ago. Um, I realize I've got to remove some of the hostility or the emotion because that shuts uh, people down generally, but it certainly shuts them down about this topic. Um, I think the only thing it's really done is it's opened up the door a little bit for me, where now a lot of white people are asking me uh, questions or bringing up the topic. So maybe they're ready to hear a little bit more. I got to tell you though, probably half the white people that talk to me about it are talking about the, the property damage that's being caused by the protests. And I have to redirect them to the real issue at hand because again, that's the way white people pivot on these topics. They, they, they wanna take the subject and move it to, well, look at all the businesses that they're destroying in their own community, that, that type of thing, not the fact that a man was murdered. Um, but it has given me the opportunity, the most opportunity I've probably had in 30 years to talk about race relations in a serious manner with whites. And most of these people that are talking to me do know that I do some work in that regard. So at least they're coming uh, a little more with um, ears instead of a mouth and, and you know, wanting to hear what my position is on it um, because they know I've been talking about it for a while. So I think it has opened up that, but the ones who are serious about it, I tell them, you know, this is, this is not a one-off. This is, this is a long, hard road. If you're really serious, this is years and years you're going to be working on this and you're going to be working on it with people who don't want to be bothered with you. So be prepared. I, you know, my quote is the, the road to becoming an anti-racist is much harder than marching down one. And that's what these a lot of white folks think they can do. And, it, and it's not going to work that way. Thank you for your, for your response. We're nearing the 8 p.m. mark. So we're going to switch to the a lightning round sort of, sort of phase because we have a lot of questions in the Q&A and we have a lot of the pre-ordered um, pre questions per se. So we're going to try to hit a lot of these questions tonight. And we're going to go straight to Professor Tanaka. Thank you, Professor Tanaka, for your question. She says, perhaps selfishly, I appreciate hearing from the panelists tonight. I am so glad that your voices are being heard. 
I know that a lot of privileged slash white people are afraid of having difficult conversations because they are afraid of getting it wrong. What advice do you have slash what do you think about the fact that well-intentioned people will get things wrong along the way? And I'd like to pair this question with another person who asked about when professors mix up the names of two or more black students, what should the students do and, and what, how to handle those situations? So I want to ask to start with Professor Holmes, would you touch on this question a little bit for us? Uh, the first question had to do with comfort level uh, in terms of trying to be an ally. Is that the essence of what the question was, George? Yes. Okay. Um, first of all, I think that all of us are going to make mistakes. Um, I think that dealing with racism on a good day is like walking in a minefield. Um, I am teaching here where I live now in South Carolina. I teach uh, in the um, Department of Education for pre-service teachers. I made a terrible mistake two semesters ago. Um, even though I spend all of my time trying to be sensitive to diversity in my class, uh, sensitive to uh, feelings, and now I'm in the South, not in the Northeast. Uh, and so there's a different vibe down here. Uh, and so I, I, I spend my, my life being thoughtful and, and trying to be sensitive. And I made a terrible mistake. Uh, I made a, a comment, an offhanded comment to one of my white male students. Um, I apologized to him privately. And I believe I also uh, apologized in front of the class. My point is that there is no point at which you will not make a mistake. I think if you do, you have to own it. I think if um, your intentions are good in the environment where you're trying to do some good work, I think people will trust you and know that your intentions were good. So should that inhibit you from moving forward? No. I think the work is really too important to not do it. Um, and so I think that we're all going to make mistakes. I, and, and I think it's partly because, as uh, Dr. Sawyer said, we've been socialized. We've been racially socialized to believe what we believe, do what we do. And this whole process of, of becoming an anti-bias um, activist really is is a an ongoing process there isn't any end to it there is no destination we are always going to be trying to unlearn biases so that predicts that on that journey there are always going to be mistakes and so you learn a lesson and you move on you try to make amends however well you can but I, I think we don't have a choice. If you really want to make a difference, you're going to have to take those risks. In terms of the students, um, I think the question was about names, students who got uh, names wrong. Yes, uh, when a professor says um, Stephen instead of George, because Stephen is also black. OK. so. I'm an African-American teacher, and I did that for one whole semester with a white student, okay? So the point is, it happens. As a student, I would say that you will have to go to the professor uh, and be honest and say, you know, you are misnaming me. In the case, in, in my own case, the student waited till the end of the semester and told me how annoyed she was at me because I misnamed her. 
And it wasn't because she looked like another white person. It was just, I was making a mistake. So I think the only way to deal with these things is to be direct, respectful, uh, and uh, professors uh, are capable of learning. At least some of us are, I hope. Thank you, Professor Holmes. Um, I have a question actually for Professor Ford from one of our students, uh, our attendees. If you just give me a minute, cause we have a lot of questions and I cannot find it. <laughs> okay, can you give Professor Ford an opportunity to give her opinion on potential action steps or allow her to answer some of the questions like being the only black in class, sitting in the cab together, et cetera. And that is paired with the question um, about what advice would you give that one black student in a class full of white people who feels like they have to be the voice for black people by default due to societal pressure? I will answer the question, um, but I'm gonna be very brief because I am sitting here, not because I'm a part of this very um, well-prepared panel, uh, people who are experts in the field. Most of you all know that this is not my field, but on the other hand, uh, I am an activist. So uh, in terms of being the only black in the class, whether or not a particular student should feel that he or she has to carry the weight, uh, I don't believe that a student should feel that way and I don't feel that a student should do that. However, I do feel that if you are in law school, you need to be prepared to speak up. You need to be prepared to be called on to express your opinion. And if, as Professor Holmes uh, stated earlier, if you're uncomfortable doing that, being called on because you're the only black person in the class, you should go to the professor, send the professor an email and let him or her know how you feel. If it happens to be somebody in my class, it doesn't mean that I'm gonna do anything differently, but at least I'll know how you feel. And I'll try not to um, put you on the spot as much. Uh, in terms of being the only, I think you were saying black in law school in my day, Camille, because I wasn't expecting the question, so I wasn't really listening. So if that's it, I was a civil rights activist, so I am a lot older than a lot of the other people on this particular um, web uh, program tonight. Um, I was born in Arkansas. I was born on the same plantation my great-great-grandparents were on when emancipation came. So I picked cotton, uh, many of you heard my story, you know, I put my quote unquote tennis shoes over my shoulder uh, when I got to school, I washed my feet before I put my shoes on, you know, we had to prime the pump, we had to use the outhouse. So bottom line is I grew up with a, a chip on my shoulder. I probably still have a chip on my shoulder uh, for the experiences that I lived on a daily basis in Arkansas uh, in a very, very segregated uh, society. Uh, when I got to St. Louis, um, I had come in from a system uh, where I had been discriminated against in many ways, and I was very active uh, in sitting and laying and praying and whatever. So I basically decided early on that my way to survive in life was going to be to speak truth to power. So being the only black woman in my law school class at the University of Iowa, I spoke truth to power. Being the only black woman on the faculty in the law school uh, at Quinnipiac University, most of my colleagues and my administrators will tell you that I speak truth to power. I think you have to be open. You have to speak truth to power. Uh, and in working with the students, um, I hope that, uh, and I know that the current students that we have will speak truth to power, whether they're the only ones in the classroom or not. So that's my response. And I'm going to go back into my little cocoon here so that you can hear the uh, advice uh, from the experts on the panel. Thank you, Professor Ford. Um, I've noticed that in the Q&A, there are a couple of people going back and forth that are a little offended by the conversation. Um, this is not a panel to well, first of all, we're not here to attend to anybody's feelings, um, especially those concerning white fragility. 
Um, if you guys could please define what white fragility means to you and how you can express to the white people attending to be to use their voice to be a better ally um, in the discussion. Um, Professor Sawyer and Attorney Jefferson, if you guys will please take the lead on that question. What was that question? I'm, I'm sorry, I missed it. It was asking about um, talking about white fragility and defining it. Um, and so so there, there's a text um, that talks about white fragility um, and the lack of the ability to be able to have these types of, of conversations. And, and some of the things that happens, um, you hear um, people who talk also about you know, white tears, where we have conversations about race, someone cries, and then that those tears are used to silence the people who are talking about their oppression um, and, and things of that nature. But part of fragility, um, I, I think, comes from this space of feeling dissonance, right? Like when you are confronted with something that you believe that was true or that was your norm, and now you're being confronted with something that's disrupting that norm, there's a dissonance that's, that, that's felt in that space. And for me, I've felt that a similar dis dissonance um, when I, I started to learn about, you know, male privilege, hypermasculinity, and things of that nature, right? Because in my mind, I'm socialized as a black man. Well, I don't have no privilege. I'm a black man, blah, 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 blah. But after talking with the women in my life who pulled my ear um, and told me to get my act together, I sent some dissonance, right? Because I was going through life thinking everything was fine, but now they're disrupting what I thought my norm was. And so I had to make a choice. Either I'm going to push away and continue to do the, whatever I was already doing and try to avoid that feeling I was having internally, or I was going to work through that dissonance and continue to read. Um, and continue to learn and not necessarily placing the burden on them to teach me, but to do my own self work. And I think that's the space where white fragility interrupts any process that white people can go on or, 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 or take the path to being anti-racist, right? White fragility is that which interrupts them on that path to becoming anti-racist. Well, quite frankly, I don't have uh, any tolerance for white fragility. I, quite frankly, I just don't care. Um, I'm uh, sympathetic to the families of Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, Philando Castile, uh, George Floyd, Rashad Brooks, uh, Sandra Bland, Breonna Taylor, a host of others, named and unnamed, uh, who have been murdered, um, unarmed, and murdered by um, law enforcement um, officials throughout this country. And uh, so I don't have time, well, any sympathy whatsoever for, that's something they just have to deal with and they need to get over it. You know, if, if, if you wanna be part of this struggle, then you have to get over that. I seek alliance, uh, an alliance with anti-racist whites. That's who I seek a, an alliance with. And, 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 and those in the black community who get it, because we have far too many in the black community who seek this affirmation from white people themselves, and many who don't even want to associate with their own blackness. And that's some of the issues that we have to uh, contend with. There are folks who do not want to associate with being black. They just don't. And um, I don't have any tolerance for them either. So, you, you know, when, when folks talk to me about white fragility and, you know, it's, it's a moot issue for me because I'm not interested in their in, 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 in their feelings about that. Try being black for 24 hours, try that. And, 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 and then uh, someone could write a book on black fragility and, and, and what black people got to deal with day in and day out just by merely existing in this society. We just merely exist because if you ask whites, why do you feel a certain way about black people? Why? They couldn't even answer. We merely exist. That's it. And that's and, and 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 the hatred stems and the contempt stems from that socialization process that started long before the birth of this republic. Long before that. And it continues to this day. 
So I could care, I couldn't care less about white fragility. That's my response. So I wanted to respond as well. Um, so first to Attorney Jefferson, you said try being black for 24 hours. And that made me think of our talk about sexism um, about a year ago. And you essentially told me try being married for 24 hours, not literally, but more so because I said that I wasn't naturally sexist. But as I've grown and learned about many different things, um, including what you know, Professor Sawyer was talking about, about hypermasculinity and about being a feminist as a male, there really is a lot to be said about being an ally. So I want to read the state, one of the statements. Um, it said, I'm hurt by what I'm hearing as a pro-typical white person who shows up at marches and holds signs. My endless hands-on work in the local community comes from my heart. I grew up very poor, referred to as trailer trash, and wanted to serve as a person who empowers young people because I know education helps us all rise up from poverty. I am so aware that poor, that poor in CT means our black and brown communities, not my rural world. I am painfully aware that these kids have the added burden of race and I always compose myself as a guest in their community, but please don't paint me as not caring and not doing the boots on the ground work. And what I wanted to say to this, I wanted to just say, just completely honestly, I have brothers on this call and I have sisters on this call and they're not all black. You, I don't think there should be any offense taken to what's being said because just as we cannot speak for our whole race, we're also not speaking for the whole you know, Caucasian population. Attorney Pellegrino is an anti-racist and I believe that from what you said, you may view yourself as an anti-racist. But again, we do not speak for all black people, which leads me to structure. You know, a movement needs structure. All these successful movements succeeded because they had structure and because they had allies. So we have another question from um, Natasia, who is asking about, who first thanked us all for being here tonight. And then she's asking about the pervasiveness of education as to the historical reasons behind the movement of the Black Lives Matter movement and how can the Black Lives Matter movement work with other oppressed minority groups to actually create structural and political change? So this is open to anyone who wants it, but how can the Black Lives Matter movement unite with other minority groups to invoke change? And or is that something that should be done? Well, it makes sense to do it. It's just uh, the other groups have to be willing to work with Black Lives Matter uh, uh, or those who are associated with the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, you, you know, when you walk out of there, you, you, you see a dearth of, of uh, involvement by the rank and file of, of, of other groups, quite honestly, you know? So, you know, we got to do what we have to do. And I think where that work can happen is in the political arena. But before, because when you look at politics, and how politics impact our life, particularly at the local and state level, uh, you can really make significant change. If you, if you talk about the local police department, the local poli police chief is appointed by usually the CEO of a city, the mayor of a, of a given city. That CEO is the same individual who appoints members of the board of police commissioners. Forget about an all civilian review, but you actually have a board of police commissioners in many uh, uh, municipalities who regulate the police. So you have to have an understanding of electoral politics and you have to be a sophisticated voter. And that's one of the things we're pushing in the Kiyama movement with our Black Men Vote To initiative is how to teach people, how to teach young people in particular, how to become more sophisticated in our politics, how to properly vet candidates, how to look at someone and think all that glitters isn't gold, how to be an independent thinker, how to, uh, identify hacks and mercenaries and folks who really don't have your interest in, 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 in mind. How to avoid being lured into uh, playing identity uh, politics. What is the role of money in politics? Just to, the, the, It's not enough to tell young people, oh, we need you to vote, register. No, you have to become a sophisticated voter. You have to understand how to really when someone shows up at their door with with their uh, paraphernalia and their pamphlet, all that, 
do have a series of questions. Where does your candidate get here? What articles did your candidate uh, write? And, and, and refer me to those articles. Real sophistic, a real sophisticated approach. And that's where I think different groups could organize together and to change um, the political structure that and, and the appointing authorities and the boards and commissioners that regulate law enforcement in our municipalities and at the state level. Thank you. That's all I can say. Thank you. And, and I think we have to think about different types of movements. And I, I know I keep on talking about, because I know I saw some questions that were talk, that, that asked about, you know, what Quinnipiac is doing in, in, a, in a concrete fashion. And so one of the things that I've been telling students who I've been meeting with is don't, don't judge us on our posts, right? Anybody could post anything, right? You know, everyone who's saying, who's posting Black Lives Matter doesn't believe it, right? Like you, you, you judge us by our actions. And so when, when, when you're looking at us and, and you see that we're saying that we're going to be the university of the future, when you see us with our second pillar and our strategic plan that talks about inclusive excellence, hold us accountable to those words by looking at our actions and seeing if we're holding true to that, right? Because words sound good, they look beautiful on, on the website, but we need to be held accountable, not for just what we say, but also for what we do on campus. And there are a number of initiatives that we have um, on campus that we're doing to bring about the changes that, that, we, that we seek, but that's what we want you to hold us accountable to. And that's another way, but specifically the students um, and, uh, and my faculty and staff colleagues who are on um, this webinar right now, that's the push as well, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's the movement larger, um, you know, national and, and local, but there's also a movement that we need to maintain um, on our campus as well. Uh, thank you, Professor Sawyer. That's a great segue into my next question, or rather, our attendees' next question. Um, I just wanted to comment very briefly because you mentioned the term inclusive excellence. And I, I currently attend Quinnipiac School of Law, but I also was, I am, am an alumni of the undergraduate campus. Um, and a lot of alumni have told me that they hate that term inclusive excellence in terms of Quinnipiac University using it because there are so many instances of students not getting internships or only getting them to fill the quota or only getting into school to fill the quota. I've had people say to me at the law school that I probably only got here because I fill the diversity quota. And so this next question is not really about students, but regarding diversifying faculty. Uh, one of the biggest problems in legal academia in general is the el elitism and gates that are historically put in place. You have the LSAT, admissions, class of attendance, and bar exam costs all stacked against those who are historically oppressed and have little wealth or are first generation law students. Unfortunately, even if you graduate from law school, unless you go to the top 10% of all schools, you're highly unlikely to ever become a professor. How do you fight against a system like that? Um, and I guess to tie it into my question, what, what does inclusive excellence actually mean and I, I know that's a lot on your shoulders to have you speak um, for a term that, you know, maybe you are not alone in creating. So, so I, I definitely didn't create the term. Um, however, I did push us to use the term. Um, for those of you who have been affiliated with the institution for a long time, inclusive excellence wasn't a term that was used. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. And so one of the things, you know, when, when, I, when I came into this role um, and started working with our current administration um, and the new president at the time, we, we talked about what, what it meant to, to be inclusive and what it meant to be excellent. Because a lot of times when we talk about diversification and we talk about equity, there's this, 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 this false notion that excellence and diversity can't, can't coexist, right? That if you diversify, excellence is therefore reduced. That's not the case, right? So we talked about being inclusive and excellent because those go hand in hand. Um, and so one of the things that we, we went with that because a lot of people talk about diversity plans, right? And so when you hear the term diversity, 
it means nothing and it means something at the same time, depending on who you talk to. And I guess some people will argue that inclusive excellence um, is getting to that place where it means nothing and it means something at the, at the same time. But one of the things is as we journey towards inclusive excellence, remember that it is a journey. Now, I've been getting emails um, from alum, um, from current students about some of their experiences here at the institution, most of them that, that, that I've never known about, some of them that I have, um, and we work to address some of those things. Um, but as an institution, we have a long way to go, right? And so that's what I'm talking about when I say hold us accountable, right? And so when we talk about inclusive excellence, we have to understand that when we talk about equity, that everything is not going to be the main thing at any at, at all the time. And so one of the questions that always comes up is, you know, how can we diversify, um, you know, our, our, our faculty, right? And so we look at our faculty, and I was just talking about this today. If we, if we look at our faculty and see, um, I had the numbers with me right now. If I'm not, yeah. And so faculty, faculty diversity at, at Quinnipiac University, right? So the most diverse schools right now is, is arts and sciences and business, right? Where they have about 34 or 35% faculty um, from underrepresented backgrounds, communications 4.7, education zero, engineering 5.8, and it goes on, right? And so one of our, our, our missions is to think about where do we want to be, right? When we think about those numbers and those percentages, because if someone says, oh, we should be 40%, why? Right? Well, how, how are we getting to that number of 40%? One of the other things that we're doing specifically as we move to diversify the faculty is for, for instance, arts and sciences, I met with, you know, Dean Bob Smart when they found out that they were going to have a number of positions open. And so I met with him and then we met with the department chairs to kind of talk about implicit bias and how we get in our own way when we're doing this hiring. And so as a result with working with the Dean and him working with his department chairs and the search committees going through implicit bias training of all the faculty members that were hired, over 50% of them came from underrepresented populations, right? And so those are the steps that we're taking. We have to do a better job at telling that story. The other thing that we're going to be working on is having a better infrastructure for people to report things when they happen, right? Because some students have also reported that things have happened, but they didn't know where to report them, right? And so we're going to be improving those mechanisms as well. Um, so I don't want to you know, keep on going on about the things that we have done and the things that we're going to do, but those are the things that I want people to continue to push on and to hold us accountable to when we use that term inclusive excellence, because when we use it, we're using it in a way that it's not empty, right? It's an active engagement um, along this, this, this road um, to becoming the university of the future. Thank you, Professor Sawyer. Um, Another question that we have is, I'm interested to hear what the panelists have to say about the term allyship fatigue. Do you all believe in that statement and is it a valid phrase? Um, anyone feel free to answer. This is my first time hearing of allyship fatigue. I don't know if someone else could like let me know. I've never heard you. of it either. So it's I have, true. You learn I have no idea what that is. Okay. Is it, is it, I'm assuming by the name, is it where people who are allies are fatigued by the work that they have to put in in order to be an ally? I mean, I don't know if that's what it, what it means, but if we're talking about ally really quickly, ally is not just a noun. We have to understand that, you know, being an ally, it's an action word, right? So there's work. And so I'm assuming based on that term that they're talking about being tired of doing that work? I have a definition that we can all go off of. And if this doesn't work for the, the question asker, then we can um, deal with it then. But allyship fatigue is used to describe the feeling of being overwhelmed and exhausted of the emotions that come with doing the work of being an ally. It describes wanting to move away from feelings of guilt, sadness, or tiredness by removing oneself from the work that makes allyship. That's interesting. Can I <laughs> no, I, I go ahead, Professor. No, I I'm I'm sort of 
smiling, not in a funny way, but it's, it's hard for me to feel, I mean, I, I can appreciate the definition, but if you are an ally against racism and the people that you are allied to are people who have been oppressed by racism, they don't have the privilege of being fatigued by the oppression and then decide, I'm going to stop. They, the, the whole history of the African American experience, and it really goes back to the quote that I opened with, which basically said that because of the constant uh, resistance to oppression and racism from 1619 up to this moment, that is what is allowing America to become America, to move toward realizing those values that, you know, we are, you know, it's been very controversial whether or not you pledge to those values. So as a person who has experienced depression throughout my life, and, and since being here in South Carolina, I learned that one of my great, great, great grandfathers, uh, formerly enslaved, came to this area where I live and joined the Union Army and fought for this country. So he didn't have the option to become fatigued. He stopped being a slave and then he started fighting. And so I appreciate that the whole process is fatiguing, but I am a mother and a grandmother and I'm still fighting. And I am tired a lot, but I don't have the privilege to stop. So that would be my response to ally fatigue. Thank you, Professor Holmes. I want to ask a question about what this whole webinar is about, which is, or one of the things that this webinar is about, the Policing Act of 2020. The proper name is the Justice in Policing Act of 2020. And several of the things that this act would be doing is, well, working to end racial and religious profiling, saving lives by banning chokeholds and no-knock warrants, it would limit the the use of um, giving military equipment to our um, police officers. It would hold police accountable in court. And I do believe there also, among many other things, it would have a registry for police officers who have demonstrated misconduct during their time as police officers. So Attorney Jefferson and Attorney Bob, I want to ask you two, do you believe that this is more than a stopgap measure at addressing these issues? Or, or do you think this is kind of just an on paper law that we're going to find loopholes around inevitably? Bob, you, you want to take it or? I, I'll, I'll, I'll start, Mike, if you want. You okay. can, Mike does uh, you know more, more of this work than I do, but I don't think it's going to have any teeth unless we have background checks, uh, serious background checks on, on people who are becoming police. I, I think we also have to have, as part of their training, an educational process that um, educates them on race and racism and uncultural sensitivity in general, um, both for existing officers and officers that are coming on uh, the force now. Um, without those two things, background checks and uh, some kind of educational process that's ongoing, uh, some of these other uh, items are window dressing. And finally, I think there has to be uh, enforcement. Um, I know they were going to run into the union contracts on some of this, but there has to be like a one strike or a two strike rule, depending on the severity of the, um, of the offense, so that police are either suspended or terminated um, based upon those offenses. I think those three things are 
from what I see are missing in the uh, policing act. But you've got to screen out some of these pe uh, people before they become police officers. And those that seem like they're sincere, you have to educate them and you have to continue that education. Yeah, I agree with, um, I agree with uh, Bob. It's, 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 it's difficult. Um, you know, the, the simple answer is for um, police officers just to treat black people as if we were white people, that's all. That's, that's really the simple answer. Just treat us like we're white people and things will be great. But that's very difficult for, um, um, you know, those in this, you know, in, who, who've been socialized in a racist society. That's, that's extremely difficult. And that's why, you know, I embrace any reform that improves uh, policing. But as, as Bob uh, stated, I, I think it begins with a screening process um, because you really, folks tend to forget and make the mistake, I should say, of ignoring the socialization process. So if you want to eradicate police brutality against black people by white officers, then you cannot ignore how we have been socialized in American society. So one solution is to create a screening examination to gauge the level of racism of a white candidate. You gotta gauge that, you gotta figure it out. And you, you have to figure out, is this person willing to uh, begin the journey towards becoming an anti-racist? You gotta find, you gotta figure that out. Because if not, you're giving this person, and in the United States on average takes 21 weeks of training. There's some uh, countries take years to become a police officer. In this country, 21 years of train, uh, 21 weeks of training, uh, you know, a couple of exams, and you pass them uh, a, 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 a badge and a gun. And, and, and they go out and do what they do, and we know the end result. And, and in the case of black candidates, you got to gauge the level of one's quest for affirmation from their uh, white colleagues. How much do you love white people? And is, is that to the detriment of black people? You got to gauge those sort of things. I, I, I'm real serious about this. This is life and death. You have to have a strong police chief who doesn't care about whether his, his, his underlings, his subordinates like him or her. She has to be able to put together an internal affairs department that means business, firing those who break the law. She has to have that. If you're gonna be the police chief, you have to have po politicians who are committed to this. And that's where the sophisticated voter comes into play. We don't recognize our power as voters. A lot, of, a lot of black males don't even participate in the electoral process. I mean, a variety of reasons. But you can't have a say if you don't vote. And, and, and if you're not a sophisticated voter, then you're going to perpetuate the existing political order. So you have to know how to vote and become a sophisticated voter. So, George, yes, I embrace any uh, action around reform that, that changes the way we conduct business presently in, in America's uh, police apparatus. But at the same time, I think you have to deal with the psyche of these officers that were given a badge and, and, and a gun because they're the only uh, entity that could take a person's life and liberty and get away with it. Thank you. Thank you both for your answers. Um... I couldn't, I definitely couldn't have said it better myself. As we segue into our next portion of the webinar tonight, I just want to reiterate the importance of understanding that we all do have to educate ourselves. Black people have to educate themselves. White people have to educate themselves. We all have to educate ourselves. We wanted to have some spoken word tonight from maybe a fellow student, but then one of my aunts graciously sent me a video which demonstrates intersectionality and the racism that is faced around the world. And I think it's very important that we see this or hear this tonight because of the fact that the Black Lives Matter movement has erupted around the world. It's not just in Hamden, Connecticut, and it's definitely not just in Connecticut as a state. So Evie Gordon will be giving us some spoken word tonight.
Hi, my name's Evie and I am mixed race. I live and grew up in the southwest and went to secondary school in the surrounding area of Plymouth. Um, I have experienced racism in my um, lifetime. Much of that came from secondary school and with everything going on in the world at the moment, I really felt like I wanted to say something, um, but I just couldn't find the words. Um, so I've written a bit of a spoken word, poem, word vomit um, to try and summarise all of my experiences and what it's like growing up down here. Um, yeah, I've titled it, Where Do I Draw the Line? Jamaica man, mushroom head. Yeah, that's not too bad. OMG, can I touch your hair? Yeah, that drove me mad. Your hair looks so much better straight. Oh my God, can you twerk? Or they'd say a compliment and hide behind a smirk. What about when I spilled my chocolate milkshake all over my skin? And one boy said, that's okay, because it just blends in. Or when my peers would sing N-words in songs at parties with pride. Yeah, it hurt, but I took it in my stride. I even took chemicals to my hair and killed every last curl on my head. That day, I ensured every ounce of my blackness was dead. And those boys who asked if my family smoked weed all the time? Yeah, okay, that's rude, but it's not a hate crime. You need to stop feeling so victimised, is what my teacher said. Is this racism or is it just in my head? You don't see the problem? Okay, that's fine. But may I ask, where do you draw the line? What about the boy that called me the N-word on Facebook? It didn't happen in school, so he was off the hook. Or that time I got told to go back to where I came from? I mean, I was born in Derriford, but by all means, carry on. What about the words, you're black, I hate you? You're black, I hate you. I hate you. But racism isn't that bad anymore. Racism doesn't really exist in the UK. You're not really that black. This is all in the past. Those things were said when they were a child. I was a child. There is no excuse for the way I was treated. There is no excuse for this abuse, so I will not be seated. There is no excuse for the lack of racial awareness that is taught in our schools. There is no excuse for this to carry on. There is no excuse for racism, and I will not stop until it's gone. And to my beautiful black brothers and sisters who grew up in a community which told them that they are not wanted, which told them that they are a novelty, that they are only a fascination, a curiosity, which told them that they are not good enough, that they are not equal, who were told to sit down and shut up when they rose to speak their truth. It's okay if these moments have shaped you, but don't you ever let them define you, because I see you, I hear you, and I stand with you. And finally, to everyone, to those who are not aware of what happens in their own community, to those who contributed to our struggle, who caused disunity, to those who were aware but stayed silent, to those who have fought for us every step of the way. You now see us. Fight for justice, fight for equality, stand with us forever, not just today. Thank you for listening. Thank you to Evie. Without even knowing it, she touched my my heart. And I think she's definitely able to touch a lot of other people's hearts. One thing that she said to me that really, or one, one thing she said in general that really touched me was that she was a child. You know, I was a child too. We all were children at one point, And the fact that we have children today that may end up never knowing a world that's different is, is a scary thought, which is why it's our job to make sure that they do. So now it's time to segue into the second half of our tribute today. What we're going to do is we're going to read the names of just a few of our fallen brothers and sisters, and we're going to give a moment of silence. This moment of silence is an iconic moment of silence that I've done in other 
panels and other webinars, and I've also done it at several protests already. It's an eight minute and 46 second moment of silence. So during this time, no matter what you're doing, if you're on your couch, in your bed, no matter where you are, I ask that you please respect this moment of silence and sit, stand, whatever, in solidarity and truly try to understand what was going on in George Floyd's head during this time. There's only one candle because this candle represents not just one person who has fallen, but everyone. It represents the black community. It represents all who we've lost, starting with Breonna Taylor, David Mickety, Nina Pop, Sean Reed, Tony McDade, Ahmad Arbery, George Floyd, and many others.
Thank you all. For those who are unaware, the police officer was on George Floyd's neck, pinning him to the pavement for eight minutes and 46 seconds. 525,600 minutes is what they said in rent about the seasons of love. And just now we were all silent for 526 seconds. That's nothing in the grand scheme of our lives, but that's everything when you consider the fact that that's all it took to end someone else's life. So thank you again for coming tonight and thank you for participating in that moment of silence. I know it means a lot to me. Now over to you, Camille. Thanks, George. Uh, before I start with my closing remarks, our tenured law professor, Marilyn Ford would like to make a few remarks of her own. Um, if you know her, she's amazing. I don't need to amp her up. If you don't know her, look her up. You'll be happy that you did. Professor Ford. Oh, your mic is off. Thank you, Camille. Thank you, George. Uh, and thank you to all of the amazing panelists. And I'm just gonna be brief, a couple of minutes. Um, the past few months have illuminated the injustice, the inequality, the oppression, the brutality that black people have endured, the lived experience of black people for centuries. As Professor Holmes mentioned earlier, going back even to the landing of the first slave ship uh, in 1619. Uh, these months have eliminated the senseless loss of life of those that George just read and the many others that he did not. The senseless loss of life of black men, black women, black children. And in particular, the murder of George Floyd has been the catalyst that has set off a protest storm that has demanded change in policing practices and dismantling of racism. And Similar to Professor Holmes, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, and I'm old enough to remember the death of someone else. And I'm gonna talk about the parallel between the impact of the murder of George Floyd and the impact of the murder 60 years ago of Emmett Till. That event was also a catalytic event. It was a catalytic event of the civil rights movement of the 50s and the 60s. In 1955, Mamie Till, a grieving mother, defied authorities and held an open casket and public funeral to show the world the viciousness of racism that was evidenced by the horrific murder of her son, Emmett. He had been brutally murdered for allegedly whistling at a white woman in Mississippi. Emmett's eyes had been gouged out. He'd been severely beaten and shot. His body had been tossed into the river with a 75 pound cotton gin secured around his neck with barbed wire. And just like the death of Gloria Ford, thousands of people lined up outside the church to view the body and then they took to the streets. Uh, Emmett's mutilated body was published in Jet Magazine and Chicago Defender and other media and it ignited the civil rights movement. Just like Emmett Till could not have known the impact of his murder, George Floyd could not have known that his death would link the racialized police brutality today to the oppression and brutality that black people, white people have fought against for centuries. When slave patrols and slave catching malicious police enslaved people and viciously beat them and killed them with impunity. George Floyd's death expressed the collective pain of generations of black men and black women and black children for over 400 years. We cannot change the past. But this outstanding program that has been brought to us tonight by two young and future lawyers, Camille Lavash and George Morgan Jr. has provided us with lots to think about. It's provided us with specific information about systemic racism and implicit bias. It's provided us information about accountability. It has been inspirational. It has been thought provoking, but most of all, it has been a call to action against racial violence and injustice. The hope is that everyone listening tonight 
will not just look at this program as an intellectual discussion brought to you by Quinnipiac University, but that we will all join together with Camille, George, and the panelists, and everybody else, and answer the call to action in any way that seems right for you. And with that, I want everybody to join me in giving a virtual applause to Camille and to George for stepping up and doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ford. Um, and I just wanna say thank you again to the public relations team, the interactive media and communications team, our panelists, Professor Sawyer, Professor Holmes, Attorney Pellegrino, Attorney Jefferson, thank you very much for your participation and your insight um, and the information that you've provided us with. And also thank you to my colleague, George. This was a lot more than I expected it to be, but you made it very, easy to plan and to put forward. And again, Professor Ford, thank you, because without your idea and your initiative, you know, this wouldn't be possible. And thank you to Quinnipiac's administration and the other professors involved in, you know, promoting the event and to our guests as well. Um, because of the time constraint, we were not able to get to everyone's question, but we do have access to those questions. Um, if your question was not answered, please feel free to reach out to myself or George. Our email addresses are available to you in the chat. Um, and we will connect you, either connect you with the panelists if permissible, or, you know, we'd be happy to act as the messenger between the two, the panelists and yourself so that you can get your questions answered. Um, we're also open to any feedback for future events as well. So thank you again for attending and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. <laughs>